will take it away. So as, as really indicated, this is uh, entitled Conserving Rare Northeastern Fungi. Um, I think, as I said in my initial remarks, that it's important to document what we don't necessarily know. And whether it's a species of fungi on a sedge that happens to be endangered, and perhaps in this particular case, this species uh, of, of fungi, this pyranomycete, is probably an obligate uh, parasite to this rare species of sedge, which by definition likely makes it a rare species of fungus. Um, there are many that we have out there that we don't know about. Um, there are some that we have, uh, for example, in the lower right that uh, don't even have names. And then there are others, which I'll talk about in the ensuing slideshow, that have names, but those names are yet temporary and they're changing as, as we speak. So with that, um, I'll just remind folks that, um, you know, conserving them uh, elicits an attention to the fact that we have an evolutionary story that is well over a billion years old on the planet. Uh, as I said, fungi are an essential group of organisms and really run the show in terms of providing all of those uh, sim often symbiotic uh, relationships with the plant world and to a certain degree with the animal world and certainly provides the nutrient recycling that's essential for ecosystem services across the globe. Um, fungi often can be a, a canary in the coal mine and I think we'll, we'll start to see that more and more with global climate change in looking at how uh, plants and consequently animals sur are surviving relative to the ability of fungi to digest a complex uh, compounds, carbon-containing carbon compounds, and provide those nutrients to uh, systems that require them. Uh, that's something that I, I imagine will provide that sort of canary in the coal mine aspect to them. Uh, but they are very often specific to environmental conditions. As we all know, they've adapted to uh, microclimates all over the world uh, with, a, of course, large uh, uh, avoidance of the marine environment. But even the intertidal, where they once began their terrestrial colonization of Earth, they have specified into uh, certain niche spaces that are uh, very specific and very localized. Our area of concern in the Northeast, uh, at least according to the historical map, uh, shows a, a varied landscape of coastal environments, largely influenced by currents and by large riverine systems and by mountain systems. And all of those have combined to make the Northeast a fairly unique place uh, worldwide, certainly with some parallels to some uh, North temperate and subboreal climes in, in Europe and Asia. But in terms of North America, the Northeast is a very different biome uh, than much of the rest of the continent. And that's evidenced by looking at a bioregional map of North America and uh, understanding the complexity of the, both the marine and the alpine or montane environments that affect the, the temperate uh, uh, forested biomes of North America in the east, uh, and then having this influence with an alpine and subboreal environment uh, coming down into the United States from our Canadian province relatives. And, you know, looking at that, that's a very broad brush picture, but we can focus in on some of the subtypes, uh, what we call ecoregions and uh, ecoregional sections that provide a more complex picture of the environment. This is a, just a sample picture from central uh, New England and eastern New York, uh, but showing how all of these elevational and um, riverine and montane affected environments have their own subtypes. And of course, we can keep breaking that, breaking that down. But zooming in a little bit more closely, uh, oh, that didn't quite work. Uh, let's see, if, ah, there we go. I had to hit on the slide. Zooming in a little bit more closely, uh, we can focus on our home base. Um, and I was asking Sarah earlier about uh, Newfoundland and uh, where you guys uh, are foring, and I should really not be focusing on St. John's, uh, but on the entire province. Uh, nonetheless, we have a tremendous diversity 
of fungi, uh, not just in Newfoundland, but of course in Northeastern North America. And um, if you have uh, any sort of capacity of doing this, I'll expect in chat uh, a answer to how many different species we have on this poster. Okay, go. Um, yeah, all right. So maybe not possible. Um, nonetheless, we have a lot of fungi we don't know much about. Some that we have a, a pretty good sense, like this Winnie asparasoides, um, and it being rare, having very few collections, documented collections uh, in the microbank database. And yet, and yet they still do occur. We had uh, just uh, last weekend at our coma foray, and unfortunately I was not, not there to witness it, uh, a Winnia sparasoides turn up. And I, I can count on one hand how many have turned up in, in New England and not but maybe two hands for the, the entire history of collecting this species. But we have others like this one. And this is, I, I took a picture of this for Andrus. If you're in the audience, Andrus, um, uh, this is a pink spored alpine species from our White Mountains. Uh, I couldn't even get it to genus. Uh, and, and yes, I haven't, haven't sequenced it, but it's one of those that when I looked at it, I not only knew that I didn't know what it was, but that it would be very difficult to find out. Um, and here again, whereas DNA is really helping us understand more about rare species and their complexity, uh, we haven't sequenced all of them. And as Rod Tulos and other uh, mycologists have reminded us, uh, using just ITS as the marker for our genetic sequence is not always reliable. Um, I always liked his uh, reference to Amanita brunescens, wherein he described uh, five different types from a sequence that varied on just a couple of different uh, amino acid arrays that uh, showed different morphological features in one species. And that the difference between uh, those types was very close, like 99.9 or 99.4% uh, similar. It wasn't nearly as close as it could be. And in other words, the DNA isn't always the answer and doesn't always hold the, the key to our understanding of it particular species. But we do have, uh, you know, certainly organism groups that we know a lot about. Nature Conservancy uh, with their regional greatest conservation need species lists for the Northeast, which you can uh, uh, take a look at through the Wildlife Management Institute web page, has a lot of information about all of the rare species that are in this Northeastern region that have backbones, okay? And if we look at birds as an example, the status and trends maps on eBird is fantastic. We can look at these in real time video and watch their migration routes to where they end up. And um, in something like this, uh, we have so much data, good dating back a um, couple of hundred years that you know birds become very well known, very difficult to name a new species of bird, let alone a, a variety of bird uh, that we haven't already studied. But fungi, fungi is very different, as you all know, um, uh, very different than plants, which, I mean, look at this e example of looking at rare plants in New England and what we have for knowledge of the populations of these plants uh, throughout not just the states or counties, but the township level. So again, we have some really good data on plants and how rare they are. Um, I belong to the New England uh, Plant Task Force and monitor 10 or 12 rare species every year in New Hampshire. And we're already, you know, we're talking about long-term management plans and fire regimes and play, things that we can do to enhance plant populations. Um, even though we have a, almost 30% of them rare in the state in terms of what we've got in New Hampshire, but we have, uh, uh, we're down to the level of, you know, managing and microhabitats and controlling invasive species in order to enhance our conservation of plants. But again, this just doesn't happen with fungi. And even something like this species, which I'll talk a little bit more later, but Tricholoma grave, um, a rare species, one of our rare 20 Northeast species. Um, we, you know, we, we have a number of records, but um, just in the last two weeks or maybe two and a half weeks, we found three new populations of this uh, this individual in uh, in the state of Maine, 
and where it had been recorded once in its entire, you know, our, our entire microbank database history, one re record in Maine. Now we've got three new ones in the last three weeks. So how rare are these? And will we be able to predict uh, their either uh, proliferation through greater searching or their extermination through, uh, through extirpation by natural or, or human caused processes. So that's, you know, some wide open questions there to answer. Um, in terms of rare species in the United States, we only have a few states that actually list them. Um, and I'll point out this one, Brigiporus nobilissimus, uh, giant fuzzy fud or the noble polypore, it's got a couple of common names. Um, which out west is a notable one because they, it's big. I mean, the thing gets up to, you know, 30 or 40 grams very, or uh, kilograms very easily. Um, but it also grows in old growth noble fir forests. And it tends to be at the base of old growth noble fir, which is a declining species in the Western United States. Um, and so this one sort of, you know, was a cause celebra. And, and uh, as of this year, we now have. And I, I have written this, you know, th here's our current status, but uh, only three species uh, that were listed here um, have propelled more coverage of rare species through the National Forest Plan, which started in 1994. And as of this year, we now have about 47 species on the state of Washington natural heritage rare list. And that just got added. So it's Washington, Oregon, California is sort of leading the way in the country in terms of identifying rare species in their state and beginning to track them. And as I'll mention in a minute, uh, uh, Fundus's uh, uh, conservation committee is helping uh, change that program so that we have fungi included in our rare species lists uh, across the, the rest of the United States. So for me, my, my engagement in this, uh, after we held our 1996 joint foray, NAMA, NEMP foray in uh, Scutney, um, was catapulted by uh, a North American Red List workshop in 2016 uh, with the following people sort of uh, going left to right. But the principal players are Dr. Greg Mueller from the Chicago uh, Botanical Garden and uh, Andres Dahlberg from Sweden. And both of them are a part of uh, the IUCN Red List Fungal Conservation Committee. And we uh, collected a number of folks from the different regions of the United States and Canada. Uh, Jean Bruby and Annabelle Langlois from Quebec, uh, as well uh, uh, from other folks from North America, uh, came together to talk about uh, what are the North American rare species in the sort of higher macro fungi group. And in that, we uh, were introduced to the global fungal red list and its procedure of nominating rare species. And at that time, you'll see there were 214 red listed, uh, or excuse me, at that time there was less than that. This is in 2019. I think there was maybe 48 or 50 species in, in 2016, grew to 214. And I'll show you a slide in a minute that has the latest sort of tally of rare fungi that are listed globally through this uh, IUCN Fungal Red List Initiative. Um, of course, Europe has been leading the way. We've had uh, the European Council for the Conservation of Fungi uh, in place for several decades, and they've got a list of rare species, and they know a lot about where these occur and, and which ones are declining uh, because they've been looking pretty closely at fungi for a long, longer period of time, certainly than those of us in North America. Uh, so in the fungal red list, if you get onto the web page, uh, you'll see different groups like the cup fungi group and the lichen group. And then the one that I've been mostly involved with, with uh, Dr. Mueller and, and Dr. Dahlberg is the mushroom bracket and puffball group. So in general, for this process, and this is something, of course, your club can do or anyone that's interested, uh, you, you know, take a look at the species records, of course, um, to look in Mycobank or uh, Mycodatabase and look at how common these things have been found and vouchered and accessioned uh, around the world. And if it appears to be that, that there is something that has 
um, some degree of rarity or threat, you can submit an initial proposal. Um, the pieces of information you'll need to do, uh, you'll need to complete rather with, uh, with that submission, uh, of course, includes the names and the current taxonomy, the range uh, historically or currently known, uh, and population and trends, which of course has to provide some context for a potential threat to the species and that species, and that is identified under the threats category. Um, I'll have an example in a minute that, uh, for example, a species that's associated with Atlantic white cedar, which is a declining tree species um, in uh, the Eastern United States. And as a consequence, um, the fungi associated with Atlantic white cedar are, are declining as well. So that's a good example of a, of a threat by virtue of an associated habitat that is also uh, declining or in, in uh, are vulnerable to extinction. Um, so those are the basic categories. Um, at some point you, uh, you come across a, 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 an initial preliminary assessment and that might be for a least concern all the way to, well, could be extinct, but not likely if you've, you're dealing with the species that is currently known. Uh, but more commonly, it will be a near threatened or vulnerable species, um, possibly endangered or, or considered rare globally. Uh, but that will be um, uh, ascertained by the review committee, which again, uh, Dr. Mueller and Ander, uh, Anders is, is, are on. Um, so uh, this is a recent poster that they put up uh, on the Red List site. So you can get a sense of some of the ones that are rare and that they're looking for. Um, and in, the, in terms of the current status, and again, this was just uh, checked the other day, we're up to about 1,232 species of in the, in the mushroom bracket and puffball group that are listed on the, the IUCN Red List. Uh, 230 species of lichens, 211 in the cup fungi group, and for a total of uh, this 1737 and 219 countries. So the efforts have, have really increased over the years, but we're continuing to, to push that out. And uh, the other rare species documentation efforts I'll talk about in a minute will hopefully help that out. So as I mentioned before, uh, the Fungal Diversity Survey or FUNDUS for short, uh, has a conservation working group. And I know at least uh, one person, Sigurd Jacobs on the call, uh, there are perhaps some others, and this is the, the list as it's currently configured, although I'll, I'll mention that Anne Francis from NatureServe has stepped away and been replaced by someone else from NatureServe. And again, with the purpose of trying to integrate fungal diversity and rarity into our existing conservation uh, organization network. You know, especially uh, nature serve. So that, for example, as I mentioned with the state of Washington, we have now a list of 47 so-called rare and endangered fungi species uh, tracked by natural heritage. Uh, we'd like to see that happen in all states uh, in the country and perhaps in all, all provinces in Canada, that would be terrific. So this group, uh, the Fundus Group uh, initiated last year a rare 10 West Coast project under using iNaturalist, and this is sort of the face page for it. And as a result, we had at that time 87 observations of these 10 species. And that was 87 more than we had when we, before we started. And so we gained a little bit of knowledge on some of these species, we found most of them. And Sigurd Jacob, who is on the call, as I mentioned, uh, kept track of the data for those rare 10 species. And we had a very good support group out, uh, mostly in California uh, and in Oregon and Washington, of course, but mostly California folks that were um, providing the background information for this and encouraging club members to go out and search for uh, these rare species out west. And this is just an example of one of the ones that was being tracked, Bondersui occidentalis, which had been, I don't remember the exact number of, of records that we had before the Rare 10 project, but after the initial pilot was done, uh, we more than quadrupled 
the number of records of Bondarzuia and found that in fact it's not, you know, it, it, it's not really as rare as we thought it was, and that's a good find, right? If we find more of these species, uh, more distribution for them, uh, why not? You know, have that information to 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 back it up. Uh, there were a couple of species we did not turn up out of the ten, so that's. Uh, you know, something that also helps us understand how rare they are relative to what we thought uh, uh, was rare. Uh, each of the species, like the golden gill waxy cap, uh, had a point location for finds. Um, and most of these were in places where we could actually, in INAT, uh, um, have some degree of location, but without private property permission, uh, for publication of that data, these some of these data were obscured, and I wanted to point that out. That as we go into um, you know our searches for rare species, we have to keep in mind that uh, not just for public knowledge uh, uh, purposes, but also for vouchering purposes, we need to have uh, cooperative land owners, whether they're public or private, uh, that are willing to have that information posted on a forum like iNaturalist or Mushroom Observer or have their the specimens from their property be vouchered in a fungarium. Um, here's another one, uh, Stereopsis humphreyi from the West Coast Project that was um, somewhere on Vancouver Island, um, but there turned out to be a few of these collections and uh, again, a tremendous and very interesting species if you know, uh, I don't, I, I think we have one, perhaps one stereopsis, at least in Newfoundland. I, I haven't looked at the, the records, but uh, I know there's one in the boreal forest of the northern New England state. So it's most likely there as well. So this is uh, also on the project page, uh, both accessed through the Fundus website uh, which if you can spell F-U-N-D-I-S and type that into your search engine, you'll, you'll come up with the, the web page and then look for the projects that uh, would have this. This is information, a two-sided poster that provi provides information for each of these uh, rare 10 species on the West Coast. Uh, the ghost funnel, in this case for Stereopsis humphreyi. Um, it also has a, a map of general possible occurrence for the species, and there's a description, and there's some more information in terms of uh, websites and other uh, citations that are useful for understanding the, the species going forward. So in the Northeast, as I said, we, we've done you know, a fair amount of work. Uh, certainly in the past, there was some uh, sort of working knowledge of, of rare species, uh, both in Peck's day, uh, the 1860s, 70s, 80s, um, uh, but certainly in uh, the days when Alexander Smith and his students were uh, making voucher collections all over uh, the Northeast, uh, particularly uh, Dr. Bigelow in, in Massachusetts um, and Richard Hamola in Maine. Um, there are a number of, of eminent mycologists that have come and gone and, and noted when things were rare, like Amanita rustichii, which is depicted here by Rene LeBeouf uh, from the Montreal Club. Uh, they've also found a few of these in, in Montreal. But we didn't have a real comprehensive understanding of, of rarity. And in, and in some of our earlier um, lists, for example, um, um, we included a couple that were perhaps not as rare as as we initially thought. Um, Amanita rustichii has only been found a couple of times in Maine and, and Quebec. Um, and there's a pretty good write-up about this because it was nominated during our 2016 um, IUCN Red List workshop. And so they've got assessment notes and stuff that talks about um, you know, how rare it is, where it's been found, uh, what habitat it, it's been found in, and so on. And so that's a, right now, it's a pretty good repository for certain species that are already listed under the ISN Red List page. But then we had species like this one, uh, the lavender uh, Bayospora, uh, Bayospora myriadophila, which is listed in Europe. And if you look at uh, the page, uh, the ISN Red page in, in, 
a red list page in, for Europe, you see that it's uh, got some good documentation about how rare it is there. And yet for us in the Northeastern uh, United States and adjacent Canada, uh, it's actually not that uncommon. Um, so worldwide, um, here's one that we perhaps have more individuals of, a greater, higher population of than what you might find certainly uh, in Europe and Western and Western Asia, especially in Russia. And so that's that's a you know sort of an interesting one for us. We had this on our list, and yet I find it every year. It's not uncommon on cottonwood and riparian zones, uh, sometimes on other species of populus. Um, so it's um, you know it's fairly regular. I can count on it pretty much every year, and that's certainly not the case in Europe. So we had to we had to sort of adjust this list as we went down. Um, here's another one that stood out right away. We had a mushroom magazine. Uh, back in 2007, the Mushroom Magazine article, which featured this uh, rare species that was uh, found in, I can't remember, it was, I think, early 1900s, maybe 1904 or 1906. And that was the last time that it was, it was found. And its, its obligate host is the Atlantic white cedar. Uh, again, as I mentioned, are, are declining uh, timber species in, in certain swamps along the eastern seaboard. Um, and uh, a couple of folks from the Boston Club uh, took it upon themselves to um, search for it and sure enough found it. And that, that story is written up in this issue of Mushroom Magazine. It's kind of fascinating. Um, and of course, if you think that it's easy to find this, you should talk to Bill Neal, who was one of the principal people looking for this thing. Uh, it's not easy to find it. They did find it in winter. That is snow. And so you can find this thing off season, which helps because if you're trying to walk through an Atlantic white cedar swamp when it's like summer, yeah, I can tell you from personal experience, it's not an easy thing to do. So perhaps uh, more of it occurs because it's a hard habitat to look in and who's looking for mushrooms in the winter, right? Uh, but nonetheless, it is rare and it is on, uh, certainly well documented to be to be that way. Another one that um, I found was pretty fascinating. I've been, as I mentioned, collecting mushrooms for over 40 years here in the Northeast, had never seen this until 2018. Never seen this mushroom. And I've been, you know, leading forays and walks. We've had Northeastern forays. And in one year, we had two collections from where I live, from the area that I live in. <laughs> And so I get on the map and I look, oh, look at that. GBIF has it all throughout the Central American countries, you know, and we've got a fair amount in the Southeast, the Midwest. So it's really not that rare, except when you're in the Northeast. So in this case, uh, considering it uh, as a rare mushroom in the Northeast really has to do with what is its range extension? How common is it at the edge of its range and how common might it come as we warm up the climate, increase our oak percentages in our forest types in, in uh, Eastern Canada and, and uh, the Northern part of New England, and uh, perhaps create more hosts for this species to occur. Uh, again, it's an oak associate primarily. It does occur in other hardwood species, certainly in the Central American countries, but for us, uh, that's its primary and it's only sort of an old growth dying or dead oak tree that will throw this thing off. Uh, so it's, it's got a fascinating story to it. And as a consequence, uh, we've put it on a rare 20 list for the Northeast. And then last but not least on this list was Winia spirosoids. I mentioned this before, we just found another collection uh, at the Coma Foray last weekend, which was great. Uh, and again, on one hand, you can count how many records we've got for this species. And we've actually had folks in this case, you can see it uh, um, sort of this wanted poster put together by a gentleman in 2018. Um, and um, that was for the Pennsylvania uh, biological uh, survey purposes, but certainly it's been spread around and, and all of us in the Northeast are, have been keeping an eye out for this thing uh, for a number of years. So in terms of other efforts so far um, for rare species, we did have for a, a stretch of time on the Mushroom Observer website, a species list of rare, threatened, and endangered fungi. 
Most of that came from uh, that forest management uh, plan review in the North Pacific Northwest and hence contained uh, mostly species from that. It's pretty close to the number of folk, uh, species that were identified for the survey and manage guidelines uh, plan. Um, <laughs> but we've had some others. And that's why I wanted to introduce tonight as well, uh, which is something that I've, I've perhaps mentioned inferentially, but you know, I'm naturalist and through the, the efforts of the Fundus Conservation Committee were, um, launching a rare Northeast challenge. Uh, and with a little bit longer of a timeline, uh, that's sort of rough, could be three years, could be four or five, but nonetheless, we want to launch this and have folks look for certain species uh, like Buter boletus uh This one, uh, Sigrid was lucky enough to find this year, just in advance of our launching the challenge. Uh, so that's a, that's a great thing. Uh, but that's that's what we're engaged with. And, you know, we're again, uh, taking off from the former Mycoflora, North American Mycoflora project or NAMP, uh, uh, rebranding it. Uh, the, this uh, group of folks who've been sort of monitoring and managing NAMP has rebranded it as this fungal diversity survey with the real primary purpose of documenting the diversity of higher fungi uh, in North America. And as a consequence, we've worked with uh, sort of the iNaturalist folks to open up these special projects to help promote the documentation of rare fungi. And uh, the rare, the uh, West Coast Rare 10 was the first pilot and this uh, Northeastern Rare 20 is our second. Yeah, rare species right there. So, you know, again, what we're trying to document 20 species just, and we, there was a, a group of about 11 of us, uh, mycologists who have gotten together and, and selected the species. Um, we want to under, study these and, and um, add more data, uh, do more gene sequencing of them so we get a sense of, uh, of what they really are all about. Um, the states and the provinces are listed here and it gives you a, a definitive region um, which you will see you are included in uh, so that we have a span from the sort of temperate, mixed temperate forests and coastal lowland forests all the way up to the alpine uh, zone, which occurs, of course, throughout the higher regions and the northern parts of the, the Canadian provinces. Um, we've launched a project page in MO and iNaturalist. Um, I'm going to underscore the need to get uh, permission to collect and voucher uh, from either public or private entities. Uh, pretty in, certainly in the U.S., most of our uh, vouchering sites, our Fungaria, are requiring that at this point. Many of them have forms now you can fill out that requires that at least electronic signature from the landowner in order to document a particular species uh, and to go ahead and, and do the, the, the vouchering. So just a couple to, to highlight. Um, each one has a great story. I, I just, you know, this one for me was just one of many, many stories, Dendrocolibia racemosa, odd little thing with white spores, looks like a Calibia, except it's got all these side branches to the primary stipe. And these side branches aren't necessarily uh, spore bearing, but they appear like they have small caps on the tips. And it's just a very, uh, very distinctive and unusual um, uh, species of mushroom that could occur uh, certainly in, in your warmer climates in, in Newfoundland. I absolutely could find it in Ontario, Southern Ontario and Quebec. Um, this collection was from the state of New Hampshire. Uh, I was very lucky to uh, be present when it was found, but very unlucky to not see it myself. And it took Christian uh, Schwartz, who, uh, who is a mycologist from California, Santa Cruz, co-author of the Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast, uh, to walk behind me and point out that I had overlooked 
this mushroom on a log that he knew from the West Coast, but had never seen in the East. And to, to this day, this is the only documented record of this species in, in the Eastern United States. Now that, in my opinion, qualifies as a rare species. Um, only documented record. So it, we, we're not even sure it's the same. It's very likely a new species. Um, you know, we do have the specimen. It, it has been vouchered. Uh, but, um, and I understand from Noah Siegel, who was with us that day, that um, this one's being looked at closely to see if, in fact, it is a new species. Uh, I was doing a survey not far from where I live in New Hampshire and came across this little individual. And I was just at the edge of a blustered forested swamp with hardwood and softwood um, and a little bit of black ash. I was writing notes in my field guide and I stooped down and I picked this thing and I knew it was different. I'd never seen it before. And lo and behold, Alexander Smith had picked this in the 1950s, early 50s, and it was the last time it had been collected. So here again, looking at uh, the database, it was pretty easy to ascertain this was a species that's not very common. And it's possible that being a little small black thing in swamps <laughs> that it's overlooked, but it's again, it's one that we want to know more about and so uh, have put on our list of 20. So in terms of the rest of the species, um, my suggestion is that you get either on the Mushroom Observer website or iNaturalist, which is linked here, um, and uh, take a look at the fundus page. And um, you can contact myself or Liam Noakes. Liam is uh, basically helping document and take in records off of iNaturalist and Mushroom Observer and making sure we have a database uh, for them and that helping me with uh, coordinating folks who do find these to A, get landowner permission and B, preserve them adequately and then see voucher them so they can be uh, sequenced and, and, and understood to, to a stronger degree than we, we currently understand them. And so that's, that's really the, the operational part of this uh, Rare Northeast 20 uh, project. And uh, we'd, love your, we'd love your support. And one last story, one sort of final, um, and what I would say is a pretty interesting one, um, relative to this guy, Squamonita umbonata, and I'll put umbonata in quotation marks for now, but this is a mushroom that um, I had seen once in 1989 at a collection that was made in Connecticut, and it was an odd duck. I had seen it in uh, Alexander Smith's uh, How to Know the Guild Mushroom book and seen a, a depiction of it. He had collected it in Michigan, um, and a couple, there are a couple of other collections that had been made, but it's pretty rare. And everybody knew it was pretty rare because nobody was picking this thing up. And so I'm walking out on a uh, 15,000 acre property that I was monitoring in the Adirondacks of New York. I'd been there for several years teaching mushroom seminars um, and you know, was out doing my monitoring uh, search and came across this individual as depicted here on the left and knew enough, having recognized it from that 1989 collection, that it was uh, a rare species A, but it had this huge sort of sclerotium, as we used to call it. Uh, it's now technically known as a mycosicidium. And that is simply because this mushroom is a parasite. Genus Squamanita, as named by Boss uh, in 1965, uh, has this unique sort of parasitic arrangement with another uh, macro fungus. Uh, there are currently three, in fact, three out of the four squamanitas in Washington state are on the rare and endangered species list for that state. So even though there are several other species worldwide, um, uh, umbonata seems to be the only one that's regularly collected whereas the other three in Washington are rarely collected and they're on, on, uh, on their rare species list. And each one of them parasitizes a different higher fungus, which I thought was pretty fascinating. Uh, I'm actually not sure what the species is that this mushroom parasitizes. Um, and I'm not sure that uh, we have yet determined that. 
Um, the occurrence of Squamanita as we currently know it is shown here on the GBIF map, which uh, with some Eastern Asian Japanese uh, records, Eastern US records, a few in Canada, and then a couple scattered records down in Central America. Um, since 1980, we've collected it about once per year till up to the year 1999. After that, only four have been collected. Um, and that was, as you can see, 2009, 14, and in 2018, uh, my collection, and there was another one from South Jersey, New Jersey. And what is fascinating about this is that the 2009 collection, which is from Massachusetts, as depicted here, lacks those obvious characters of having an umbo on the cap, hence umbo native, right? And the Mushroom Observer record for comments for this collection was, where's the umbo, right? And so there's an in, two individuals who are currently doing the DNA work on all the collections of Squamanita umbonata, and guess what? <laughs> They're being separated into new species. And the one that I collected in uh, the Adirondacks appears to be its own species and the only collection of that species thus far. So not only do we now have to make our list of rare 20 Northeast 22, <laughs> because these other individuals appear to be new species of Squamanita as yet to be named, the publication is it's in press right now, uh, but we are learning that, um, you know, that some of these may even be rarer than we thought. That the records we have for something that is rare actually uh, has more than one species involved, like that Dendrocolibia racemosa, and in fact could lead us down the path of, of rarity that absolutely makes something um, you know, worth uh, listing under the IUCN red list. Um, and so there, therein lies another reason to collect something uh, like Pseudofistulina, which I mentioned before, um, because we may be dealing with more than one species, even though it is a rare species to begin with. So I, again, I, I, if, you, <laughs> if you have any interest in these sort of, uh, you know, weird and strange turns, unmistakable as they are, uh, I encourage you to join in the search for some of these, some of these species. All right, so uh, with that, um, just like some of the things that we look for in the woods we don't expect, and maybe Sasquatch was looking for some <laughs> Squamanita, um, I encourage you to uh, keep your eyes open, enjoy each other's company in the woods, finding mushrooms, and remember that besides eating them, we really need to pay more attention uh, to understanding them. So here's the invitation. And again, I thank you very much for your, your attention. And we'll, we'll get into uh, some questions at this point in time.